our first presenter is Dr. Gerhard Agri. Complaining seems to be the worst thing what I can do, but nevertheless, I will have to do something, some complaints about what's going on in Hungary. Uh, because whatever we think uh, of the extent of uh, attacks on academia, suppression of academic freedom, and the very significant differences, that's a process that is going on in Hungary since 2010, although intensity of the process changed gently around 2016-17. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, my main point uh, will not be to give a detailed outline of what happened, rather thinking about what makes it possible to reconfigure academia uh, significantly uh, without too much social resistance, and actually uh, not just uh, thinking about uh, the social reactions and the relations of research to society, but also the internal uh, structures of academia. So please, uh, why? So it's important to mention that around 2010, when Fidesz won its first two-third two majority at an election, there were huge expectations from uh, academia Fidesz. For many reasons, the academic community felt itself uh, oppressed, sidelined, uh, felt a kind of uh, false judgment from politics. Uh, it is also very important, as uh, social research has proven, that Fidesz built a very vast network of civic societies, which included uh, figures from academia at local level, at county level, but also figures of uh, science of national uh, prominence. Uh, and it was uh, integrated into a complicated system uh, and mechanism of political mobilization, but also mechanisms of rule. Uh, it gave Fidesz power to mobilize, but also uh, it legitimized Fidesz uh, through the support of prominent academics. Uh, nevertheless, uh, within this general sense of being sidelined, there were certain constituencies uh, within the academia who felt themselves particularly sidelined uh, in the humanities, uh, where since 2010, uh, at least rhetorically, uh, those trends that were easy, more, much more easy to align with trends in the Western academia seem to dominate. Uh, some uh, research directions were very often labeled as some kind of backward nationalist. Uh, and also within the arts, that's a quite, quite significant community, especially in terms of uh, strengthening community identity, communal identities. Uh, in general, the academia felt being exposed to false criteria of evaluation, that's the typical story of neoliberalization of uh, academia, uh, science matrix, uh, citations, and also underfinancing, uh, uh, withdrawing the basic foundings from institutions and replacing it with uh, money from grants. So when, uh, when Fidesz won, uh, one of its politicians, Josef Palinkas, who is also a physicist, a nuclear physicist, was the uh, chairman of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and everyone expected that with the help of Palinkas, uh, Fidesz will remedy all the problems. What happened was, however, and this is the second, uh, more of a reorganization, what uh, on the surface seemed to be a rationalization, but in practice brought a very different construction uh, into academia, reinforcing also very many existing uh, structures. Because for the, uh, in the Hungarian academia, it is also quite typical what we can see in many academic communities, especially in small ones, and Hungarian academia is a comparatively small academia in a country of 10 million per, uh, inhabitants. Academic clientelism, cronism, 
uh, guild mentality was pitted against this kind of scientometric evaluation. And uh, it, would, it's not e it, it would be unfair to say that those who criticized these uh, phenomena uh, had no point at all, uh, while we also know that exaggerating the importance of this neoliberal criteria setting can lead to uh, hollowing out actually what's uh, very important for academia, that kind of uh, free space where people and researchers has uh, time and has the resources to think about fundamental issues as well and not just pursuing immediate research goals <coughs> for the next one or two years. So it came to reorganization and this reorganization goes on and on for many reasons. Uh, most importantly, uh, because the logic of the political system does not allow to keep people in one power position for uh, a long time. So Palinkash was actually dismissed at one point and replaced with the uh, uh, Laszlo Palkovic, who, not, who is now a minister for innovation and technology. He was prior to this position, uh, state secretary uh, for higher education uh, as well. Uh, and Palinkash had his own structure erected. Palkovic has his own structure erected uh, for their own purpose of exercising their own power over the whole uh, science field and academic field. So the means of this kind of reorganization were a rotation of leaders at the research centers and universities, replacing the old ones with new, more loyal to Fidesz or students more loyal to Fidesz, uh, creating these new power centers around the figures of the key uh, leaders of academia and capturing existing institutions, most importantly, the Quality Assurance Institution, the National Council of uh, Accreditation, uh, which was first captured and then also legally circumvent when it came to, for example, uh, abolishing gender studies from the Hungarian University Kulikor. So uh, seemingly keeping a kind of uh, institutionalized structure, there, are, there is still a lot of space for arbitrary and discretionary decisions uh, and individual uh, and also institutional uh, ones. Uh, how the system could reward or actually punish uh, people, they could award titles, positions, money, uh, there are a lot of uh, grants, for example, mostly financed from European Union money that are not uh, awarded by uh, the national bodies that are awarding the large grants. So one can easily get an individual scholarship uh, that is much more than a regular salary of a university, uh, assistant professor, whatever. But personal networks uh, uh, could have brought even more significant rewards. So for example, just uh, to uh, highlight the absurdity of these decisions, there is one new historical research institute in Hungary, which was established by the government, but it's a private institution. It is founded by the government every year, and it was established by eight doctoral students of history. They got uh, 100,000 euro per year, uh, if you think of it as a nonsense, it doesn't mean that what they do is uh, worthless, quite the contrary, but it is completely exempt from any kind of academic scrutiny of uh, well, uh, value and output. And the result is uh, what you would expect. They pursue their individual goals. It is not integrated into any kind of academic network, especially not internationally. Uh, so while it provides some kind of safety for those within this institute, it doesn't bring the goals that are stated or that were stated when it came to uh, its uh, uh, establishment. Uh, so there is a semblance of meritocracy, which is often combined with weak academic input because alongside Clio, we can find several other uh, government funded uh, research institutions, especially in the field of history, but now it started to extend to other uh, fields as well. Uh, and uh, it's important to note that uh, one of the reasons it could happen is actually that the logic of science is very much unknown for the public. So uh, the way how 
the academia itself evaluates research and researchers uh, is could very often be much different from the one the public attests to kind some kind of prestige to researchers uh, and that helps uh, disguising the arbitrariness of these decisions uh, especially again in the field of history it's quite common that certain historians who are uh, very popular uh, or certain practitioners of history who are very popular are not necessarily even historians in a proper sense, but they are popular. And uh, if they are rewarded by something that could get a public approval, if a historian who is not very much uh, known uh, gets something that could even be a uh, 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 reason for uh, some kind of campaign against him, whatever. If that did not yet happen, but that there is a possibility so please the uh, next uh, so uh, what actually emerged is kind of a prebendial feudal system even within academia where strong men has their own followers and clientele they could get an institution from the government with funding it could last for a while who knows how long it lasts and uh, uh, and it's very important to see that it's not confined to uh, science, humanities, and social sciences, but it also happens in the fields of uh, natural sciences. Uh, what is very important, even in the case of natural scientists, that they should so show some kind of affinity with the ideological goals of the government in broad sense, promoting the national grandeur. So, and if you credibly promise some of these power holders uh, in the government that you your research will bring national grandeur, they could award you some uh, money. So it can bring in fake science and legitimizing fake science, like uh, there is a social futuring institute at the Corvinus University, which is doing fake science. Uh, the head of this institute, or one of the heads of this institute has no academic credentials at, at all. He's just a businessman who was uh, ambassador to London, but very well versed into the business circles of around Fidesz, and nevertheless, they are doing it and uh, pretending. But there is, for example, uh, uh, real research on, on vaccines in Hungary, uh, especially since COVID, uh, even though to get the money, they visibly had to uh, promise that they will deliver a vaccine on one year, on one and a half year, <laughs> which they couldn't do. And no, these uh, researchers are actually depending on the government because they didn't believe, uh, deliver on their promise. So they are exposed to any kind of harassment. And you can see how they actually communicate during the pandemics, how much they don't criticize the government even when they have reason. Uh, and this is again, a very important element of the whole structure, the, one of the means of silence. So there are obviously divisions still within the academia and the government could play on this uh, as well, but also divisions with society. Uh, the typical is the natural sciences versus social sciences and humanities. Nevertheless, just as, uh, and it's also important here to note, probably going back to yesterday's uh, talks as well, that freedom of academia is not just about uh, freedom of pursuing your own research and publishing your own uh, research results in academic journals, but also the freedom to tell the truth when communicating with society. And this is what uh, most importantly is absent from the hum Hungarian situation. Uh, most researchers can still pursue their own research. Uh, gender studies is probably the most exposed to some kind of suppression, but still you can find uh, significant gender studies research in Hungary so that I wouldn't say that it, it's eliminated from the field, but uh, but uh, just like it is exemplified by these uh, vi virologists and their vaccine story, they are actually uh, uh, hindered in communicating the truth to society. Uh, and it's quite important to see how it is now extended to the natural sciences as well, that were for a long time sought to be immune from this kind of danger. Uh, there is a division between research institutions and universities because of the high teaching load at the universities. And there is a divisions along political lines. Nevertheless, uh, there was a shift in the last years in terms of the support of the academic community and the more educated strata of society for uh, the government. Uh, and it is not independent from the conflicts that ar arose around uh, certain 
issues of academic freedom. Probably the turning point was the, the academy of uh, the controversy around the research institutes of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, which were detached from the academy and uh, transformed into a government uh, run uh, research institute network. Uh, there are also uh, significant conflicts around, uh, let's say, symbolic issues uh, within the humanities, gender, but also history. And it is again very important to note that since the Hungarian basic law, the constitution, uh, consists a uh, few paragraphs of which uh, legislate historical truths, it is again a very interesting situation. No one was yet persecuted. But we know from the Polish case that it can come to a persecution on the basis of these legal provisions. Uh, and there is a conflict be, uh, between, let's say, new institutions and existing ones. My institution is one of those which was harassed by the government. Uh, uh, they uh, practically want to eliminate the institute, but as it's a private institute, they have no uh, legal means like they had with the uh, 56th Institute, which they could easily merge with another research institute because it was a government founded uh, private, uh, foundation. So what they did was nationalizing a part of our archives uh, and without compensation. So they actually included a new provision into the constitution, which declared that our archives were always state property. Uh, so we can claim to be one of the few institutions at, on the globe, which also has a place in co uh, the constitution of its country, although we did not want and would not want to be. They uh, evicted us from our premises uh, through a long litigation in which the Supreme Court delivered a highly controversial and problematic verdict after political pressure was put on them. Uh, and we still litigate around uh, material issues. And we obviously don't receive any kind of uh, uh, budget uh, support since 2010. So we have to try to survive uh, by other means. Uh, and occasionally we are exposed to some kind of political harassment smear campaigns as well, just as it happened with every institution that became uh, that was put in the crosshairs of the government, like the CEU, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, and uh, some lessons. Uh, so as I mentioned, there was a shift of support. So while in 2010 there were high expectations and the most educated, the more educated people were, the more they supported Fides. No, this uh, relation is uh, reversed. No, the Fides very much trails the opposition uh, in polls among the most educated by 10 to 20 percent, uh, depending. And so there is a real change in the uh, within academia as well. Nevertheless, there are still uh, there is still uh, core support retained even among academics, especially among those who are rewarded by the system and who now run the institutions as well. Uh, it's important to note just again, that the social distance of uh, academia from society, uh, the problems, how it could recast its role within society after, for example, historians losing or deliberately uh, uh, rejecting this role of being the nation builders, which uh, is a much easier uh, role for gaining uh, influence uh, in a nationalist uh, context. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the problems with finding the, re, uh, the proper means of engagement that could mobilize society, not necessarily for political goals, but just, uh, just uh, being more, accept, uh, being more uh, receptive towards these new ideas coming from new research. And also making the logic of the academia and the research better known for society. These are issues that we are uh, struggling with, but I don't think that neither in Hungary nor uh, anywhere else we could uh, really resolve it. Critical social sciences in an especially weak position, you can guess it from this, in a nationalist context where uh, most of the society uh, is receptive towards this kind of ideas of national uh, grandeur. It's very, uh, and also uh, just as a historian, I want to uh, 
uh, as a last remark mentioned, the problems with uh, history and memory. Memory is very much uh, fashionable and much more, much easier to, to sell socially, so to say, but it's in very important uh, points differs very much from history and the logic of memory uh, seems to be right now very different from history. So this is again an issue which we also should think of how we can uh, resolve. So, so thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Piotr Fresky with speech history on trial, the attack on Holocaust researchers in Poland. Please, you are very welcome. The floor is yours. First of all, I would like to say that uh, the, the, the speech of, of, of previous speaker could be also dedicated to Poland case. I, I, I found uh, plenty of similarities and, uh, you know, there is only a difference in title that th th this speech probably one-to-one uh, -one could be dedicated to, 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 to Poland case. Uh, yes, uh, but uh, but of course, from my point of view, there could not be a better panel for the topic uh, uh, that I will take up uh, because th th this this title and 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 my speech fits very good. Um, and but I would like to start from the very very short uh, introduction uh, b before I conduct a very specific and very particular case studies, uh, but this introduction, I think it's absolutely necessary uh, to understand the um, circumstances and the, um, uh, let me say, atmosphere of, for Holocaust uh, researcher um, uh, in, in Poland and, and of also particular cases. Uh, so, uh, since the debate over the crime in Jedwabne, in a small town in Poland, there was a crime committed by uh, Polish neighbors against their Jewish neighbors, and they were murdered uh, during the Second World War. And from this very debate, a wave of Holocaust um, distortion has started to rise. Let me say that this uh, debate took place in 2000, 2001, um, and um, uh, since this debate, as I said, the distortion has started to rise and it's spread in the very center of public discourse for several years. Uh, not on the periphery, uh, on the margins, in the pages of, I don't know, fascist magazines, but in the so-called mainstream. But it is Holocaust distortion, however, is, is not about the claim that Holocaust did, did not happen, that the gas chambers did not exist or they served something else. Such radical variant uh, did not catch on in Poland. Um, the, um, the currently uh, practiced Holocaust distortion is based on the denial of various forms of Polish complicity in the Holocaust. Its presence is especially visible in those countries where the Germans gained support in murdering Jews. In Poland, the evidence of scale of this complicity in the Holocaust only grows and along with it, Holocaust distortion uh, progress. Um, but the Polish version of Holocaust distortion was particularly intensified when the party named Law and Justice took over power in Poland in uh, 2015, and of course it is still continues. Um, let me say that this ruling party made politics towards past and memory, the foundation hallmark of its political program. They set its tasks at home and abroad, and above all, they institutionalized its memory, establishing or supporting <clears throat> various institutions, various museums, various redoubts. Of course, all of them involved in defending um, the good name of Poland. Additionally, uh, the party law and justice still tries to subordinate the already existing institutions influencing the shape of the memory of the Holocaust. For, for example, by appointing loyal 
implementers of its historical policy. Obviously, the authorities are faithfully served by the right-wing media uh, in the implementation of the, this specific historical policy. Uh, and let me one more time underline that this historical policy implemented towards the memory of the Holocaust consists primarily in erasing the problem of Poles' complicity in the Holocaust and emphasizing Polish heroism in saving Jews. Uh, of course, I'm talking about all of this it, because it's necessary to provide the necessary context for understanding this mentioned by me atmosphere in which independent Holocaust researcher work. Uh, and they have became, I'm talking about the Holocaust researchers, the, the target of a campaign that also attacks, of course, freedom of speech. And I could give you a many examples of such a practices like, I don't know, dismissal historians from workplaces, and of course, this famous all over the world, the, an attempt to amend the act of Institute of National Remembrance and, and introduce in this, uh, in, in this act, uh, article, which provide for the prosecution of persons who, are, who contrary to the facts attributed to Poland and Poles responsibility or call responsibility for crimes committed by the Third Reich. I think that this very well-known example and this, this attempt failed under the pressure of uh, international public opinion and some institutions. Is, so I would like to, 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 uh, to, 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 to draw your attention and dedicate my time to two specific cases. Um, and, 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 and first one is a reaction to the publication entitled um, the Night Without End, uh, The Fate of Jews in Selected Counties in Occupied Poland. Uh, this book edited by uh, Bar Professor Barbara Engelking and, and Professor Jan Grabowski is a two volume publication um, that sums up a several year research uh, uh, project carried out by the Polish Center for Holocaust Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences. And, and um, among other things, the book presents well-documented examples uh, of murders by Poles of Jews seeking help. The book came out in uh, April 2018, and its release was followed by meetings with the authors and discussions of it. And at the beginning of uh, 2019, this publication became a target of an attack by the right-wing media and the state-controlled Institute of National Remembrance. Numerous texts prepared by employees uh, and associates of the Institute of National Remembrance uh, reached the media in this time. Uh, and in the view of accusation made, which concerned um, inter alia and the selection of sources, methodology, but also the allegedly unfounded uh, uh, accusation of Poles of complicity in the extermination of Jews, the authors of Night Without End decided to react. For this purpose, they prepare a set of separate responses to the articles of right-wing journalists and reviewers uh, from, from uh, the Institute of National uh, Re Remembrance. They were all published on the website of the Center for Holocaust Research. And in, 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 in his own answer, Professor Jan Grabowski, one of the author and, and editor of, uh, of this book, draw attention to the, let me say, common feature of publications by historian from the Institute of National Remembrance and their supporters, of course. He wrote that this type of writing uh, has a name in the literature of the Holocaust. It is a specific form of denial widespread today in Eastern Europe, which Manfred Garstenfeld calls Holocaust deflection. But the publication uh, Night Without End not only provoked reactions that perfectly show the various phases of, uh, of Holocaust deflection, in case of problem of Paul's complicity in the Holocaust. Its authors were also prosecuted 
and the historians found, themse found themselves uh, on trial. Uh, the authors of the book, of course, this case is very complicated and I give you just a brief description, but the authors of the book were formally accused by 80 year old woman, uh, Filomena Leszczyńska from the village named Malinov. She accused the authors of defaming the memory of her uncle, Edward Malinowski, who was a head of the village of Malinovo during the war. Leszczyńska demanded an apology, financial compensation, and an admission by the authors that the purpose of their publication was to accuse Poles of murdering Jews. In fact, however, the lawsuit was inspired and conducted by an association called uh, Reduta Dobrego Imienia, in translation, it is a, the good name redubbed the Polish League Ag Against Defamation, uh, which had contacted Filomena Leszczyńska, persuaded her to, to file a lawsuit, financed the lawyers and publicized the whole case in the media. Uh, what is very important that this association is founded by the state and supported by the uh, current authorities. Its main goal, the main goal of, of this redoubt is to fight against the called anti -polonies. This redoubt supports the historical policy implemented in Poland and stubbornly defends the vision that Poles did not take part in the Holocaust during the war, but on the contrary, they saved Jews and mass. A mistake that, that good name redact found in the well-documented publication, uh, which includes over 1,800 pages, concerned that the content of one very short paragraph and at the same time, one of the hundreds of people mentioned on its pages. It turned out that there were two Edward Malinowski in the pre-war Milanovo and author Barbara Engelking confused them in the chapter of the book she wrote. Moreover, the author quoted two different testimonies about the attitude of Major Malinowski, a relative of Filomena Leszczyńska. The testimony of Jewish survivor, which showed that he was jointly responsible for the crimes against Jews, and the sentence of the post-war card in which the same woman testified in defense of the village administrator and the court acquitted him. Both of these versions of events were quoted in the book, although Engel King believed more the testimony that convicted Malinowski. Uh, on the February 2021, the court of first instance in Warsaw issues a judgment in the case of Holocaust researchers accused by Filomena Leszczyńska, but in fact, by this redute of the good name. The court stated in its ruling that the personal rights of relative of the village administrator Malinowski had been violated and ordered an apology. It did not, however, impose financial compensation uh, on the historians. But ultimately in August, 2021, the court of appeal found the lawsuit against historians unjustified and dismissed the lawsuit in its entirety. Important words were said um, in the justification of the judgment. It was noted, of course, in Teralia that interference in scientific research is not a task for the courts and the courtroom is not the right place to conduct a historical debate. In addition, the subject of court proceeding should not be assessment of the methodology of historical research, historical sources, and just the assessment of the historian's technique. If the court were not to decide on all of this, it would constitute an unacceptable form of censorship 
and an interference with the freedom of research and scientific work. Uh, of course, the final verdict of the card is a cause for satisfaction, but the question remains, what was the purpose uh, of this lawsuit? And for sure its primary goal was to discredit famous Holocaust researcher and to challenge the results of their main research project. But at the same time, this case was intended to frighten all Holocaust researchers and make them careful about what they write and say. These intentions were perfectly identified by the accused Barbara Engelking, who wrote that this kind of lawsuit, lawsuit against the author and editor of the book, is an example of so-called strategic lawsuit against public participation, abbreviated as a SLAPP. Lawsuit of such time aim above all to undermine the credibility and competence of the people's weight to burden them financially with high penalties and lawsuit legal costs and to provoke, it's very important, to provoke a chilling effect so in this case, uh, effect of discouraging other researchers from investigating and writing the truth about the extermination of Jews in Poland. But now in the end, I would like to highlight another case. And for this purpose, let me move um, from Poland to France, but specifically to Paris. Uh, on February, 2019, at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences, HSESS, took place a conference entitled The New School for Holocaust of Historical Research on the Holocaust. Its honorary guest was Professor Jan Tomasz Grabowski, uh, Professor Jan Tomasz Gross, the author of uh, Neighbors, mentioned by me. But in addition, the conference was attended by researchers from the Center for Holocaust Research uh, place in Warsaw and also from Jewish Historical Institute and some other uh, institution and Polish centers where research on the Holocaust and antisemitism is uh, conducted. The French host also prepared lectures and the scholars from the Center for Holocaust Research present the individual studies that make up this mentioned publication Night Without End. Or perhaps that's why the state controlled Institute of National Remembrance sent its own historians to Paris. I would like to underline, they were not invited by the organizers, did not present their own papers, but they were among the audience and their purpose of their visit remains for me unclear. But undoubtedly, however, they tried to defend a good name of Paul in Paris against scholars presenting the results of the research, but they were not alone. Uh, there were about 30 people among the audience, audience of the conference who tried to disrupt its course by whistling, shouting, making noisy, make, making noisy comments. And additionally, this group waited for speakers outside building, shouting anti-Semitic statements about Jewish henchmen, Jewish money, and, and many others. And faced with this kind of uh, behavior, the conference organizers informed the protesters they would be asked to leave the room. Additionally, representative of the aggressive Polish group did not respect the rules of the conference and recorded presentations. This records uh, hit the media. The Polish community had protested against the organization of this conference earlier. They sent an open letter to various institutions in which they wrote that the participating polar researcher are nothing to do with academia, represented anti-Polish attitude and so on. Uh, the letter ended with the appeal to the conference organizers to cancel this event 
or invite different speakers. The French organizers did not succumb to this pressure, but reacted to what happened in Paris during the conference. At the beginning of the second day of the conference, a statement was read in which the events of the previous day of the conference were called regrettable. It was noted that unworthy statements were made in the call of the Collège de France, some of which were clearly antisemitic. It was mentioned that many of the conference participants had received threatening letters and messages. The organizers emphasized that the event was academic and just there was no place for screams defined as patriotic. Those who came to the conference to defend the Polish historical policy, denying the complicity of the Poles in the Holocaust and other dark pages, of course, in the history. Uh, but however, um, it wasn't not only critical voice that came from France in connection with uh, the events taking place during the conference. The French Minister of Science, Frédéric Naval, wrote a letter to the Polish Minister of Science and Higher Education, and she expressed her expectation that the Polish authorities would distance themselves from antisemitic excesses. She drew attention to the lack of any reaction from the representatives of Institute of National Remembrance present at the conference. She also mentioned that the Paris conference was heavily criticized in the social media uh, by the Institute of National Remembrance and the Polish embassy in France, which could be considered as an, an acceptable interference with the freedom of academic research. Friedrich Naval appealed to the Jarosław Govin, Polish Minister of Education, for respect for freedom of scholarly research and for an academic discussion from, free from the political pressure. The Polish minister also responded with the letter written in very condescending tone. He stressed that he was pleased that Vidal called about the freedom of scholarly research, which in fact in many countries, this is the quotation, is threatened by the ideology of political correctness, censorship and, censor and self-censorship on academics. And what else, he offered help in the reform of the French education system, assured that he know how huge problem France has with antisemitism. Jarosław Szarek, the president of Polish Institute of National Remembrance, also sent a letter to the French minister. He defended the institute against the accusation made during the conference in Paris. He also complained to the organizers of the conference that the participating historians from the Institute of National Remembrance were not allowed to speak. And similarly to Minister of Polish Minister of Higher Education, um, um, Mr. Govin, President of Institute of National Remembrance, also uh, shared the opinion that there was no reason to claim that there had been any incidents in Paris and emphasized that antisemitism is a problem, not in Poland, but in Western Europe. I'm trying to sum up, but the events uh, to, 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 to that took place uh, at the Paris conference became a subject of numerous comments in the Polish media. And the pictures of Holocaust researchers like uh, Jan Tomasz Gross, Jan Grabowski, Barbara Engelking, although she was not in Paris, were shown in the main news program of the Polish uh, television to illustrate the news material about, there is a quotation, festival of anti-Polish lies held in Paris. The Polish right-wing media called the conference itself, there's also a quotation, the Sabbath of anti-Polish witches. For this media, this particular academic event was not just a proof of anti-Polish attitude of domestic scholars. The fact that they presented the research findings at the foreign symposium resulted in accusation of being traitors and the hateful campaign against them was organized in the media. 
Thank you very much. And now uh, this is the time for the next speaker. And I uh, would like to present you Professor Shamil GP from the University of Cape Town. Uh, when, I, when Jerome invited me, and thank you very much for inviting me, I, I, I told him, you know, I, I'm not a philosopher. Uh, I'm just a very regular historian. And, but now I see uh, I'm the third historian on the panel, so I feel very welcome. Um, uh, historians are obviously people uh, with a lot to say about this topic, although uh, in South Africa, the people who write about this are, are philosophers. Um, but I, I uh, said yes, because, because I'm a teacher, I'm at an institution. I, 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 you know, we, we work in institutions and this issue is very real when you're making decisions about what to include, what not to include, when um, there's questions of funding, whether to take funding, what kind of strings are attached to a funding. Uh, there are so many issues at the sort of micro level where the larger issue of ethics and academic freedom plays a role. And I uh, serve on a number of uh, panels to investigate the humanities and the state of the humanities in South Africa, two official commissions of this kind. And then I've been very involved in CODESRIA, the Council for the Development of Social Science in Africa, um, on their scientific committee. So I, I visited many uh, higher education institutions on the continent. I'll say something about that in a moment. But coming back to my topic on uh, ethics, freedom and ethics, I want to tell you two or three stories quickly that reflects this complicated issue. So um, I won't mention names to protect the identities of people because some of these things are still in progress. Uh, recently, the South African Journal of Science, a uh, premier journal uh, of the Academy of Science, uh, published a little, a small article um, not a major article, but it was published. Um, and the article, uh, the bottom line of the article was that black students are not interested in the sciences. Black students pursue disciplines and go to faculties and careers where they can make money. Um, this was published until some people picked this up. And it was published, uh, it was a, a sociologist and an economist or some, somewhere at that uh, level of expertise with a lot of data, lots of data, because it was based on interviews with students at the university. And oh my goodness me. And then the, then, and these are not racists. These are not people from the old establishment or these are people who pride themselves to be liberals. Um, the, to cut a long story short, the journal refused to withdraw the article. It was published. The Academy of Science issued a statement um, in defense of academic freedom. Um, but there were one or two very interesting responses that raised the issues of social responsibility and ethics. And at the same time pointed to the serious flaws in uh, the research, in the research methodology, and in the um, insult really to, uh, to the black student population. So if you look, for instance, at the number of white, whites and whites, young people in say accountancy or the money-making professions, it is far, far higher than the black students and the blacks in a country with only 7% of the population is white. So the research was deeply flawed to make such conclusions. Uh, the, the ethical question then comes in. In a country where uh, uh, there's vast inequalities and people have a legacy of an assault on their dignity, uh, an article like this is carried in a prestigious journal, what is the ethical issue? Um, with regard to, to this. The same happened, another two issues I'll say, when a number of years ago, uh, African studies course that was going to be taught to everybody at my university was launched. 
there was a professor of African studies, newly appointed. Somehow he was excluded from developing a curriculum for this course. And a course was issued, a course outline with not a single black or African author. Um, the defense was, again, the academic the freedom fence. This uh, uh, led me to look at my course outlines. And I subsequently, I wasn't part of this effort. Uh, I've never had this. It wasn't a racist. It was also sort of scholars, mainly white, in fact, all white, who were liberal. Not, not racist that you would think. But the, 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 it led to a series of seminars and events and discussions and so on. It led to the issue of ethics, of what do you do in a situation where a particular uh, a type of scholarship, a particular type of a particular sector of your population has been excluded over the years, and all you want to do is publish and uh, give uh, publicity to a particular type of literature, to a particular type of scholarship, to stuff that's been published by mainly stream journals and so on. I have subsequently uh, been making a very conscious effort to, to balance it, to, and in fact have a far richer uh, program of teaching material that is often very difficult to get. I can go on a last issue, which was the most controversial issue of, of ethics, and uh, then I'll make some general generalization, is with regard to BDS, the boycott, divestment, and uh, sanctions campaign, which South Africa knows a lot about because it was, it was originated in this country with international pressure for apartheid government to change. At the uh, University of Cape Town, where I am recently, the Senate and the Council voted on BDS to support this campaign um, in relation to Israel. A couple of months later, the vice chancellor instructed that the Senate and it should be rethought and it was uh, canceled. It was abolished. It was caused a big controversy because it was voted through the structures of the university under pressure from funders. And as a compromise, as a compromise, um, the university admin administration said, we will create a fund to research um, the experience of the Palestinians, to research apartheid in, in Israel, et cetera, et cetera. This hasn't yet created controversy and an open competition was launched and two quite fascinating uh, proposals were, uh, received, were awarded the funds, one by the law school and one by the School of Architecture, um, which in fact could have far worse consequences than the BDS because it was making direct parallels with legal experience, legal disabilities under apartheid in South Africa and Israel, a forced removal, separation of people. But uh, uh, there's no, there's been no consequences as yet. So there, there are a, a number of experiences here in South Africa of this kind at institutional level. Um, and interestingly, the experiences I tell you of are all at institutional level because the uh, way we, uh, our higher education sector works here is that the constitution recognizes academic freedom as part of freedom of speech. And we have a fairly strong uh, culture of institutional autonomy. So institutions with a very hierarchical structure of a administration and a university chancellor and vice chancellor, senates, councils, deans, etc. It can be quite a long process to come to some decisions, um, but we do have institutional auto autonomy. Um, but there's a lot of contestation. There's a lot of, uh, uh, of issues that, that um, where you begin to think of self-censorship uh, just to get, 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 get away with things and to get on with things. Just to, to, to give you the broader context, South Africa is probably the exception on the continent. Because on the, in, in Southern Africa and in the rest of the continent, at the moment, in the last year, we've had four coup d'etats. Um, we've had uh, a, a very, very weak democracies and an exceptionally weak higher education infrastructure. And so that at some of our universities, 
they barely have a budget and they survive on uh, foundation money, on outside funding, and they survive because lecturers have second and third jobs. And so it's just an office space they have, but the real work is not in the institutions. In recent uh, times, and this is, this is not a situation that has uh, uh, been the case forever. This happened in the 80s when the World Bank advised that higher education on the continent was a luxury. So if you look at journals, for instance, in the 1980s, African presence was until the 1980s, African presence in a field like African history, for instance, was far higher than when you come to the 1990s because the infrastructure was just on the advice of the World Bank was just uh, 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 imploded, just destroyed. So it's not the situation that it's, you know, an, an African condition, a permanent condition. It was a historic uh, conjuncture and uh, that, that led to this. So that we, uh, uh, universities were systematically underfunded. Libraries, for instance, I've gone into libraries where no new books were bought since, say, 1980. And a new phenomenon emerged in the last 10, uh, uh, 15 years where um, European and American, particularly European embassies and foundations um, have um, subcontracted a lot of research on the continent to universities. And what has happened is students and lecturers and everybody has, have wanted a piece of the cake and have turned their pure research into consultancy research. So we have ridiculous situations of students in history departments writing history essays and then adding recommendations. Um, you know, I, 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 a colleague in Nigeria told me, don't think this is uh, ridiculous in history. I've had it in the English literature department um, where you know, students are being trained to write for the consultancy world uh, as if they're working for NGOs and they um, having to uh, report on some uh, problem, social problem or uh, ecological problem, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody wants, and it's, 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 it's so the, the, the problem in most of the African uh, institutions has been, it's just an absolute luxury. It's an absolute luxury because it's so tenuous, it's so fragile that um, to, it, it doesn't even, it, it, it arises in very few cases. You're lucky to be able to, get, to, to have your office to do some teaching um, and your, the, the, the big benefit for you is to secure a consultancy, which uh, will be a value. Now, the, for the continent as a whole, there's a fantastic document which, which is too little known outside the continent. And it's in fact too little known in the continent. And that is the Kampala Declaration on Academic Freedom of 1990. Um, this was a declaration that the organization uh, Codestria um, uh, put together after a conference on academic freedom in 1990 in Uganda, in the capital Kampala. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it is the gold standard on the question of academic freedom and social responsibility slash ethics. Um, that is, that ought to be far widely known, far wider known in the continent. In 1919 is a crucial date because between say 85 and 1990, about 20 African states had military governments. And then you just don't even raise the question of academic freedom. But this uh, document, um, it, it's not a long document. You can access it on the Codestria website and um, get the essence of this um, desire and this demand and the conditions in, um, on the continent for cultivating academic freedom. And it speaks to our particular conditions, but also uh, it can be of relevance to say Eastern Europe, which uh, we, we should be having a conversation with um, as well. The second um, 
statement is a statement from our Academy of Science. Um, I can't get the date now, but this is far more up to date with the current situation. The, in, when the Kampala Declaration was written, the involvement and the penetration of capital of big companies, of the private sector in the university was not yet a phenomenon. This is a phenomenon of the 2000s. Um, the question more in South Africa, at least the top five or so universities receive quite a bit of private money. They state universities, but a state, the, these universities wouldn't be able to maintain the prestige or the research output, especially in the sciences, but also in the humanities without uh, big monopoly money, you know, big insurance company money, um, health insurance companies, banks, et cetera. And it's, it's, it's just amazing what these companies do um, and how the, 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 the university is just in, in, in quiet ways bought off and, and just assumptions that things will be uh, funded by these institutions. So 1990, there's nothing. So that document is only about state interference. Remember the late eighties was the era of military rule. So the 1990 Kampala declaration is very much in that context by the 2000s and the document of the Academy of South Africa on academic freedom. These are the three issues. The one is government regulation. So increasing government regulation, um, more and more detailed um, management of the university, despite our autonomy. So the autonomy becomes really theoretical, but the level of reporting uh, and uh, to get the funding, um, is uh, becoming increasingly uh, manipulated by the state. Um, I can give you many examples of how this is done. Um, sometimes it's meant to be for the social good. Um, sometimes it's simply just a state exercising its um, authority. So these, this first threat is government regulation and over-regulation. Um, second one is the private sector. Massive manipulation, massive um, uh, involvement uh, and threats uh, to withdrawing the funding if you um, uh, teach things that's um, questionable or not in their interest. Um, I mean, this is particularly in our schools of economics, in our management uh, schools and so on. And then finally, university administration, which is a big one. Can you, what is your right to challenge the university administration? Is that a subcategory uh, in academic freedom? So here's a story, a very good teacher of mine, um, some years ago exposed nepotism in a university administration and he lost his job. Um, and, there was no way that at that time he used all the, the argument that I can recall around academic freedom was, uh, was raised. And it was quite clear. Everybody knew the, the vice chancellor and all the big, this is a university in a small town, was so involved in contracts and, and it was all seemingly above board but it was nepotistic uh, contracts for all sorts of things. Um, the thing is, us as scholars and lecturers, we are so passionate about what we're doing. Uh, we don't have access to much resources. You get sued and you get driven to the courts and you get worn out. Um, so my, this colleague that I'm mentioning, senior person who was a teacher of mine, um, lost his job, which was a rarity in South Africa. Um, he, just, he just lost his job. So these are the three things at the moment. Overregulation, overregulation, for instance, on the percentage of undergraduates that you uh, uh, graduate. Now, how does that, you know, so, so, so we have a very 
bad reputation in many universities for not graduating students in three or four years because the students are so unprepared. What that means is the university regular, the university will force the lecturers to uh, dumb down the curriculum. That's intervention and to have a higher pass rate. Um, there, there's an example, to have a higher pass rate. And uh, the whole question of race comes into this again. So I, I don't know if my time is up, but uh, the situation in this country is extremely different to, 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 to even the countries surrounding us. Um, and at the moment in the rest of the continent, it's an extremely fragile. There are points of great um, uh, progress and reconsolidation of the higher education system, but it's very, very slim, very, uh, um, uh, very um, slow, and a new phenomenon of the private university. Uh, and which is attracting the best scholars. Uh, so all sorts of American institutions coming, all sorts of Christian institutions, religious institutions um, being allowed to occupy the higher education um, landscape. Thank you very much. So I will sum up some things because you, you, you mentioned several times giving a very, very touching examples in your extremely interesting speech about some behaviors, about the attitudes, but 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 in the same moment you said that, but yes, it, it, it wasn't a Russian attitude. They are not Russians, they are liberal and so on. You know, I, I know this part of discourse also from Poland that for example, oh no, it's not the anti-Semitic statement. They are very democratic, they are very liberal and so on and so on. And, and my question is because now in, we are in the situation when the rushes and many different form of prejudice um, uh, react in the different, different forms. They are vivid in the different forms. So maybe we, 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 we shouldn't avoid this category, a rushes or rushes, to, to describe such a attitudes or, or behaviors. What is your opinion about it? Uh, in South Africa, when one thinks of racism, um, in the first instance, um, you think of the legalized form of um, uh, a prejudice, you know, laws and legislation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, then, then you think of people's attitudes to, to other people of another color, of another background, and so on. And um, it's, a, it's an interesting, so, so if you develop a curriculum without any black people on it, you know, it's bec because, I don't know, you know, and, and, and these people are not people who would support legalized racism. They would not refuse to go to a restaurant where there are blacks. They would in fact have blacks as very good friends. You know, <laughs> it's extremely difficult to, you know them, I know these people, but, but they would say no, this is, and they would, yet they would defend the curriculum where there are no black writers on it. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really difficult uh, uh, situation and an issue um, where it's, because it's a, it's a sphere of life where perhaps it's racism indeed, you're right. It's a sphere of life where they just didn't think blacks have arrived at the level where they uh, deserve to be read. So they, 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 it's a kind of racism. You're correct, in fact, now that I think of it, they haven't yet arrived. Or, you know, our publications don't look like it's coming from America. You know, it, it, it's, it's badly put together. It's, it's, so you, I'm now, now that I'm thinking of it, responding to you, it is a kind of racism. But I would never thought of it like that, that they don't deserve to be read. Yeah, because, you know, I, I, I'm thinking also about for some Sander Gilman's text and about the category, for example, of self-hatred Jews, you know, mm. about this category of, you know, mm. auto-antisemitism sometimes. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think that it's very problematic and it's a very huge topic, but, but maybe this category of rushes is still useful 
to describe, you know, some practices, for example, mm -hmm. not just to say, no, you know, they are for sure they are not Russians because of their, I don't know, their, their, their I, liberal ideology or, mm -hmm. or, 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 or some different statements, but in somehow it could also appear. Yeah, no, no, I, I didn't, I didn't talk to it. Thank you very much. Um, um, it's, 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 I'm also very careful are very careful of this because we're seeing a rise of identity politics of a very bad kind where every time you want to uh, silence somebody, you use the term racist. You know, every time, you know, this has been a moment in South Africa for the last five years or so, which has been extremely debilitating to our institutions um, because of the fall movement, the, the uh, fees and the roads must fall and all this movements that that uh, has seen also a, a rise of a kind of nativism, which I think that, uh, so that's why I'm so careful about the term racism, because the other side is, uh, it, it, firstly, it's instrumentalization all the time. Uh, and then uh, a kind, there's a kind of identity politics that, um, as closed off debate, whereas we want debate and not simply uh, shutting up people because of the color of the skin or, um, yeah. And I think the university, even for these people, must be a space of debate and of um, exchange, yeah. Okay, so I have a question for uh, Dr. Evie uh, concerning the, the evolution or the development of uh, resistance, let's say, uh, in Hungarian academia, because I'm a CU graduate. And for me, it was uh, very interesting to hear the whole context of uh, what the situation uh, looked like since 2010. So my question is, uh, why do you think that in 2017, when the concept of academic freedom was uh, used to mobilize uh, some sort of energy and, and resistance, why this wasn't sufficient for resistance across Hungarian universities and, and academic institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. So do you have like other questions? It's also a question for Gabor Egri. Uh, concerning the 19... Can you... Can you uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very okay. much. Uh, the 1956 uh, Institute of History, yeah. I, I know that uh, there were a lot of battles and uh, so just a, a small question about the secure situation <laughs> of people who were working in this institute and what kind of resistance there and production. And mm -hmm. I have two, two questions, one for uh, Gebo and uh, Kurt actually, and uh, another one for um, Sherin and um, Shamil. Uh, the question for Piotr and, uh, and, uh, and Gabo is, is, is the same question. I, I, and I, wondered, I wondered to what extent uh, these authoritarian um, pressures that we can identify in both countries, even they, they take different forms, are connected to uh, 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 neoliberal reform or reform of managerialism in research because I, I had the impression that sometimes they have justified by modernization, by reform movement, but in fact their effect is to, uh, um, um, to, to, to multiply, multiplicate or strengthen the, the, the political pressure on, on academics. That, that is the, the question for you. And the question for, for Shamil and for uh, Sherin, uh, Shamil referred to uh, boycotts during apartheid um, before, and you presented the, the PDS movement. I was wondering if you think uh, this kind of movement can be also uh, adopted, adapted, uh, adopted for other, other situations. So yesterday we had the, the example of Belarus, the example also of China. So, uh, what, what could be, um, let's say, the, 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 the violence you can, uh, the, the, what, would, what, what would, do you think it would be adaptable and, uh, and for, for these situations or for all of 
Thank you very much. I just have a question uh, also uh, that I wanted to address to Gago and Piotr. Um, the cases that you uh, explained uh, uh, are taking place uh, inside the European Union. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask, because it's, an, I think, uh, uh, perhaps a, an interesting context, uh, what you would uh, say, how or in which way um, the, this broader European contact how, uh, helped or uh, was problematic. Uh, um, well, of course, we know uh, in the Hungarian case, but perhaps uh, in, uh, in, in Poland as well, there is a broader geopolitics of uh, academic freedom uh, as well with uh, the CEU and the American question. And uh, now, as I've heard uh, also, uh, Chinese money and the Chinese university project. So, so if you just could contextualize a bit what you presented in these uh, terms of European uh, Union. Thank you very much. Maybe I will uh, answer together the last one from Jerome and from Professor Hugo. Uh, for the first one, uh, why wasn't it sufficient? Uh, I think one of the reasons that we can uh, see here that by uh, 2017, this kind of uh, differentiated uh, means of taming academic institution was already in place and these uh, hierarchical relations very much helped uh, to stifle many of the uh, energies that were exist actually existed within these academic ins non academic institutions uh, but uh, they couldn't really be released institutionally so individually you can could have seen people protesting uh, against uh, the removal of the academic institutes against the uh, persecution of the CEU. Uh, some people even publicly made clear their disapproval who were even on the right in political terms or in broader terms, whatever. But institutionally, that was a, this kind of taming effect. Uh, many institutions were practically fearful of making a public stance uh, and you could see that they maneuvered around it if a university wasn't ready then the department of if the department then the professors of the department of the of the or the teachers of the department issued something and but from these uh, clever framings that distanced themselves from the institution you could see that there is the energy but also there are the those uh, breaks in the system that makes it impossible to get released. Uh, and I think that actually the CEU and also the Hungarian Academic Sciences generated a kind of very visible resistance to what happened. So that was uh, unusual and actually uh, contributed to this kind of social shift. What I pointed out that no, the Fidesz is very much trailing among the more educated strata of society, the opposition and not leading it. Uh, that's quite important. For the uh, 90, uh, for the 56 Institute, uh, the people are dispersed uh, there. They most of them didn't want to uh, work with uh, Maria Schmidt in the uh, House of Terror because the foundation was actually uh, merged with the House of Terror. Uh, the director Janos Emreiner is a member of the Academy of Sciences, which gives him a kind of security as long as the academy in sense of being a body of these uh, recognized uh, scholars uh, is intact uh, and the others could find some place somewhere. They continue operating uh, under the umbrella of a foundation which publishes every year a kind of yearbook that brings together these scholars and some others. Uh, but this is what was left. Uh, the archives is, uh, I think it's with the Veritas Institute. So you can see that this is a complicated uh, story and there is no resistance without uh, the Institute itself. So it's rather a symbolic deed that they still exist in a symbolic sense. And taking together the, uh, two questions on authoritarian pressure and neoliberal reform and the uh, Global. I think they are. Uh, they uh, they very much. Uh, they very much uh, 
are connected, uh, especially because at least in the Hungarian case, it's quite visible that uh, the external and still more neoliberal global context is shaping what is happening and also shaping the logic of the system as well. Uh, what I mean is that uh, in Hungary, it's ever more clear that actually what's going on is not a real neoliberalization, but rather a re-feudalization of the system, which is, uh, which is an important difference compared to what academic freedom meant in the 19th century when it was supposed to be, or even earlier, it was supposed to be the collective freedom of a body that is part of a feudal society as such. And now we have individual academic freedom and less and less collective freedom. That is manifesting itself also in the way how the jurisdiction of a rector within a university is uh, cut back and uh, these bodies, uh, administrative bodies are taking over. But the external logic is still that kind of uh, higher education ranking logic that drives uh, uh, policy regarding the higher education and academia in this. So this is, uh, which is very much fitting to this uh, nationalist idea of national grandeur. But this is a field where Hungarian, Hungarians should prove themselves. We need to have a university among the highest ranked 100, 200, 500, whatever the actual goal is. And, uh, and in this sense, uh, the justification of the reforms is always adjusted to this kind of externally imposed logic of neoliberal competition of higher education institution. But that also means, but that's also uh, uh, actually uh, helping those actors within the system who are closer to the applied sciences or those sciences that are uh, those fields which could much easily transfer their results into business as well. It's not a coincidence that the present leader, the strong uh, figure within academia, Laszlo Palkovic, who is the minister, was actually is a member of the academy, but he's actually an engineer who was uh, working on car brakes. He worked decades with a German company in Hungary, making leading its research arm there. So he is the one who actually pushing this kind of reshaping Hungarian research towards much direct uh, contacts with business, with the foreign capital, mostly the uh, car industry, but also degrades other fields as well. So this is also part of this power uh, game, even within academia. Uh, uh, and, uh, and here comes these, uh, especially the foreign uh, investment in higher education. The Chinese case you mentioned, uh, or some quoting of, uh, for example, American Catholic University. Notre Dame has actually no uh, branch somewhere in Hungary operating. Uh, that's mainly on a supposed ideological ground. You know, if many of the Notre Dame professors I know would uh, start to talk with Hungarian uh, Fidesz politicians, they would be really abhorred of the views of the Hungarian guys because they are much more liberal than the Hungarians. But nevertheless, it's a Catholic university. The Hungarian politicians term Hungary as a Catholic or a Christian state. So, uh, and in the Chinese case, it's again about uh, bringing in a university that is a high ranking university, establishing a branch here and hoping that that will actually lift Hungary in this ranking. Well, thank you very much. So we have like a four more questions and three more speakers. So two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, okay, okay. Probably I will Sorry. give like um, the first spot uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Hussain. So uh, thank you. I'll I'll be very quick, or I'll try to be very quick. Um, I think that what's what's powerful about the. 
or the reason the call for BDS from Palestinian civil society had such power is because it is based within a grassroots movement. And, uh, and the call came from Palestinian civil society and, uh, and was sub supported by this grassroots movement that had uh, three very clear demands and uh, that were unified as a collective uh, and a unified vision for how they saw uh, the future uh, struggle and how they wanted to reformulate it and stuff. So it was within a grassroots political movement. Uh, and so uh, the call for solidarity then, as, as the activist was saying, a lot of European uh, and North American and global general uh, groups and associations that are part of the anti-war movement or part of the kind of internationalist revolutionary left uh, wanted to act in solidarity, but they were not uh, clear on what the vision was anymore or what kinds of actions they could take. And the way that solidarity works is that the person within the context as a unified collective that is grassroots and not uh, linked to any uh, to kind of uh, leadership that is corrupt, like the, what you want to say, like the Palestinian Authority, for example, uh, makes this call and the call is, is, is in their name. So, so European solidarity movements or groups or people like Black Lives Matter, for example, can't uh, act in solidarity, let's say with uh, the people of Yemen, unless in this kind of way, uh, unless the people of Yemen have a unified call and, and make this. But if this happens, of course, the, the aims will be different. The, the, the guidelines will be different. The political goals will be different, but of course it's, it's, it can happen anywhere, right? That we're, that's. Well, unfortunately we uh, don't have time for next questions. Uh, which we address to our speakers, but we can uh, talk about it like uh, here, like in unofficial way during our coffee break. Uh, so thank you very much for your all questions, remarks and notes. And uh, it was a pleasure to, to share this uh, panel. So thank you very much again. And um, thank you for speakers and for presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all the other speakers. I learned so much. It's a pity we didn't have time to talk again. Thank you to Sherin, Pietro, and Gabo, and the chair. Thank you for all, all of you. Good. It was a pleasure to be here, yeah. and, and thank you very much. Yeah, and let's hope we do it. It was again. very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. I learned a lot. Yeah. Thank you to you both. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Thank you, Sherin. Thanks.